Let me share with you some words from the book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. It's been a while since I've made a personal confession from the pulpit, but this retelling of the story of Jonah is striking a chord within me. And so I'm going to be vulnerable and share some personal truths with you. The first one is this. I never wanted to be a pastor. Honestly, some days I'm still amazed when I'm filling out a form in like a doctor's office and under occupation, I watch my hand write the word minister. And almost unfailingly, the doctor or whoever is taking the form from me is also surprised and asks me about it as if I was pulling a prank by pretending to be a pastor on my intake form. And I look at them and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know why I wrote that, but it's true. <laughs> I had wanted to be a writer Specifically, I wanted to be an English professor who wrote between my lectures. And that's why I went straight from my undergrad work into a graduate program at Chapman University where I completed the dual master's degree in English and creative writing. And as graduation approached, I found myself stalling and procrastinating every time I sat down to apply for PhD programs. And so I went to see the campus chaplain and I asked for spiritual guidance. I'm planning on becoming an English professor, I told him, except something in my brain is blocking me from moving forward. I just look at the PhD program descriptions and they're not interesting to me. And so he asked me what would be interesting to me. Theology, I said without hesitation. Religious studies. I grew up in the church and my faith has always been a big important part of my life. And all of my writing has become really spiritual lately. And I have a lot of questions about Christianity that I'd like to explore. And I proceeded to just keep rambling and rambling about my deep desire to pursue theological studies until finally the chaplain placed his hands on his desk and he pulled out a couple brochures and set them in front of me. And he said, I think you're being called to seminary. And I just stared at him confused and I said, to do what? And he said, well, study. I think you should seek answers to all of these questions you're asking. I think you should saturate yourself in theological studies and just see what God is calling you to do next. So I took the brochures and I thanked him and I left, determined not to take his insane advice. I met up with a friend that later that afternoon and I told him about the conversation. And he said, like, seminary to become a pastor? You're, you're actually considering becoming a pastor? I said, no way. There's no way I would ever be a pastor. I don't even like people. <laughs> and church, I tell you what, I'm not kidding. As those words were leaving my mouth, I kid you not, 
I felt God's call on my life. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. It bloomed in my heart. And in her famously still small voice, God said, you don't even like people yet. <laughs> Jonah was doing whatever it was that Jonah wanted to be doing when God called him. Go immediately to Nineveh, God instructed. They're really messing up over there, and I need someone to let them know that they need to change their ways. Got it, Jonah says. Head east to Nineveh. And then Jonah promptly hustles west across the Mediterranean Sea to Tarshish. He literally hightails it in the opposite direction of where God just told him to go. Why doesn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? Well, it's the capital of Assyria, and Assyria was Israel's enemy. Assyria invaded Israel, overthrew them, and took control of everything north of Jerusalem. They scattered the Hebrew people across all of the ancient world. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel displaced, lost. It was devastating. So God is calling Jonah to go to the last place on earth he wants to go. But I think Jonah's running away is even deeper than that. I think Jonah isn't just afraid to go and be among his people's enemies in a contested land. I think Jonah knows exactly how God works, and he doesn't want to be a part of it. Jonah knows that God is merciful and compassionate and slow to anger and quick to forgive. Jonah knows that God has storehouses, unlimited storehouses of grace. And Jonah knows that if he goes where he doesn't want to go, that he will share this good news with the Ninevites, his sworn enemies. And he knows that if they repent, God will forgive them. And then Jonah will have become a complicit instrument of God's grace to people he can't even fathom having a conversation with. And that is just about the worst scenario Jonah can imagine. So west to Tarshish he goes. Jonah is hoping that God will forget about him or give up on him or call someone else for the job, or send him somewhere else, anywhere else. He boards a ship with a one-way ticket in the opposite direction of Nineveh. But surprise, surprise, cruising away from God's calling is never smooth sailing. First, a storm comes. We skipped this part in our reading, but Nancy mentioned it to the children. A storm comes, and the sailors on the boat are terrified. And Jonah confesses he's on the run from God, and that it's his presence on the boat that is causing the storm. He suggests they go ahead and throw him into the sea, which at first they refuse to do. We're not going to do that to you, they say. And then they realize this boat is going nowhere with Jonah on it. And so they finally agree, and they toss him overboard. And then that big famous fish swims up and swallows Jonah for three days and three nights. No Netflix, no iPad, no, sm no smartphone. It's just Jonah sitting alone in a fish's belly for three days and three nights. That's half a week with his thoughts. History has turned that big fish into a whale because it's the only sea creature that we can imagine being big enough to swallow a human. And since this sermon is all about telling the grown-up version of our beloved Sunday school stories, let me just clear this up for any of you who are routinely getting tripped up by the whale thing. This almost certainly did not happen. <laughs> I won't say it for sure didn't happen because I wasn't there. But let's just call a fish a fish and be okay with the fact that this is probably poetic fiction. Because I think we can all agree, this story is not meant to teach us how long a human can survive inside a whale. That is not the point of this story. The point of the story is this. God calls everyone, you and me and Jonah, to be instruments of God's grace, even when it's hard, even when we don't want to, and even when the grace we are a part of is for other people people we may not see eye to eye with. And that's why even if this story is just a story, it still offers us truth. Sometimes truths about God are so deep that it takes a fictional story to illustrate them. 
Jesus told these types of fictional stories in order to communicate deep truths all the time. They're called parables. Now here's why the book of this, Bi this, book of the Bible is called Jonah and not the Ninevites. I think God called Jonah not simply because God needed her word to be carried to Nineveh, but because Jonah needed to speak this word to those people he would rather not have been in contact with. Jonah needed to be an instrument of grace just as much as the Ninevites needed a prophet. This was Jonah's calling. This would change him. It would, if you will, help him become more of a people person. And this is why I relate so much to Jonah. After 12 years of ministry, I now believe that God called me to be a pastor, not just for the congregations I have served and loved, but for my own salvation. I still sometimes question whether or not I am truly a people person, because people are just so people-y. <laughs> they hurt each other, and occasionally they hurt me. They are selfish, and sometimes I am too. They harbor grudges, they make bad decisions, and they say the wrong things. And so do I, because as it turns out, I am a person too. But people are also generous. They can be shockingly kind and brave and funny and creative and compassionate and forgiving. And as a pastor, I get to not only witness all of that, I get to learn from it. I get to grow from being surrounded by and immersed in the lives of people. And I get to find these same good qualities in myself and cultivate them because as it turns out, I am a person too. Jonah and I dragged our feet to answer God's call and maybe you did too. Maybe you're still sitting inside your proverbial whale hoping that God will just forget about you or give up and move on to the next name on the list. Spoiler alert, she won't. She's just patiently waiting for you to come around. But don't worry, this urge to run from God's calling in your life is normal. Even Jesus, if you remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, prays to God, I don't want to do what you're calling me to do. The book of Jonah ends with no resolution the tension between God and Jonah remains. Jonah finally does as he's told, and he goes to Nineveh to let them know they have 40 days to knock off their peopley behavior or God will overthrow the city. And they listen to him, and they repent, and they fast, and they change their ways, and God saves them all, including their animals. And Jonah is so bitter. Ugh, you're every bit as merciful and compassionate and forgiving as I thought you were, he tells God with disgust. And now you're saving all of these peopley people in Nineveh. And God says, yeah. And that's how the book ends. <laughs> There's probably a reason why Disney hasn't adapted this one into a movie. They're still working out how to put the spin on it. Answering God's call, agreeing to participate in God's grace is no easy task, especially when you realize saying yes will send you to Nineveh, and it's full of Ninevites. But the world needs each of us to set aside our fears and our hesitations and our self-doubt and our instincts of self-preservation in order to share the good news of God's love to anyone and everyone who will accept such audacious mercy. Even the peopleiest people, including ourselves. Amen.